Good morning. I am hoping that your morning has started off well or your afternoon or whenever you're watching this. I hope and pray that it has been a good one. If not, if not, sometimes our circumstances cause us to be sorrowful or have other things. I pray that you just come in this moment and breathe and just feel his presence. That is what I pray for. So we're going to open up with our hymn um, today. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. We need to be able to sing his grace, his praises. Um, that's where the Holy Spirit comes. Sometimes we don't feel like singing that. Uh, and that's where, where James says that we, we gather together. That's another reason why we should be in our churches worshiping together is so that we can pray for each other so we can mourn with them and encourage them that God has not <clears throat> forgotten you because sometimes we just feel where are you God in the midst of our storms and he says I am with you but sometimes the, the storm is so loud we don't hear the silent voice so we come together and we worship so join me as I croak along, because um, <clears throat> I don't know what has just happened, but as we sing along, um, God's praises. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, calls for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming song tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come. And I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy mercy, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for your many, many blessings. Thank you for a good night's rest. I pray, Lord, that you will be with us, Father, <clears throat> wherever we are, whatever storm we may be going through. And we, you know, if we're not going through a storm, May we praise you. May we praise you and be an encouragement to those that are downhearted. May we lift up those that, that need to be lifted up because we know you hear our prayers and our cries. I pray, Lord, that you open our hearts and minds so as we sit at your feet today that we will, we will learn from the lessons that you teach us that enable us to be bold as those we see in Scripture. Thank you again for your many blessings. In your son's precious and holy name, amen. All right, so yesterday we started um, Isaiah. <laughs> I am reading Jeremiah and Isaiah. But uh, we started in, in Genesis chapter 22. We got to verse 8. And it says that, or actually, we got further than that. We got to verse 10, and Abraham has picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. In these verses, the reader allows us to feel 
the writer allows the reader to feel, whoa, good morning. <laughs> For Abraham, how agonizing would it be to hear your child ask you, we have fire and wood, but where is the lamb? Where is the sheep that we're going to use to sacrifice? And we don't hear Abraham angrily annoyed at the question or annoyed at God for putting him in this situation. You know, um, he instead we hear him believe that God will provide what is needed. That is some amazing trust in the midst of the storm God is going to provide. I don't know how, I don't know what, He's told me to sacrifice, and therefore I'm going to I'm just going to stand on his promises. Um, there, there's no denial, there's no anger, there's not that God that Abraham didn't believe or couldn't believe that God would supply. Um, sometimes when when people stand firm in their faith, it appears like denial. Um, but in the end, you know, God knows the heart. Or it, it might may look like some weird, well, you're just one of those weirdos that just believes and 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 yeah. What if we really did believe, just absolutely believed? I don't know how God's going to change the circumstance. I don't know how God's gonna do. But he's going to do it. And you know what? It may, it's not going to turn out the way I think it is. It may not turn out. I mean, we are very, very limited in our understanding when it comes to God. And God sees options and possibilities that we cannot physically imagine. How is God going to do that? God is not bound by our concepts of physics. Physics drive us, not drive God. God created physics. God created the parameters that we have to abide by, but he does not. Remember, he is outside of time, and that just blows me away. But what we are supposed to is, is that with complete obedience, Abraham will learn and learns that God is ultimately all he needs. Job loses everything. And the, these two guys, these two men, are the, are during the same time. They're contemporaries. They live during the same time. And they both learn. I mean, Job learns that when his when everything is taken away, when his body is is nothing but sores, and he's taking pottery shards, to ease ease or get the 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 pus and stuff off of his sores, maybe to scratch them, you know. I'm sure he he reeked, uh, just smelled bad, and all of these things. He learns that God is all he needs. Can we say this about ourselves? That if we lose everything, is God everything? Can we say that? You know, we say, oh, well, that was easier back then. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. That's a lie. Things are not easier, were easier back then. Yeah, we have a lot of commodities. And you know what? Those can be the tares and the weed, the, the, the weeds that keep us from seeing, that hold us back so that we don't see God's grace. And we come to verse 11, and it says, at that moment, here is Abraham. He is, he is not halfway, oh, look, oh, look. He has the intent of following through. He's, he's not even focused, well, God will intervene. I wonder, what, I'm going to wait and see what God does. No, he has raised his arm. He is getting ready to come straight down because he knows this is what needs to be done. It says in verse 11, at that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Don't hurt him in any way, for now I know that you are truly 
uh, you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. And this is the only place where we read that God will rescind or uh, really change his mind. There might be some other slight moments, but this is a huge moment. Um, and he, he stops the action before the follow through. And you go, know, well, God told me to jump off the cliff. And, and we might go up to the edge. I was talking to someone about this that I could stand on the cliff. And I can say, well, here I am, God. I'm on I'm, my feet. I'm almost over. And he said to jump off the cliff. But, you know, Lord, yeah, it's a long way down there. Jump off the cliff. Uh, see, the, I got one leg hanging over the edge. That is not what Abraham did. He was ready to go ahead and bring down. He trusted God so much that he knew that he could do that. And a lot of us won't jump off the edge of obedience for anything because we, we, we don't see, well, I jumped off and look where it got me. Yeah, you might have, it may be in a, in a big thicket of thorns. Uh, maybe God didn't say that. Maybe he did because he wants you to experience as painful as it is. Look at Job. He experienced some pretty painful things. In the end, the reward was greater. And you know, we might go, well, I wouldn't want to. Yeah, you do. You just don't know it. It's like eating foods that you that you don't like. You may find that you do like them. And with God, he's shaping and molding us. Uh, one might question, how come God recognizes that Abraham truly fears him after all? You know, God is all-knowing. Uh, we have to differentiate between knowledge as cognition and knowledge as experience. Uh, we can agree that God knew ahead of time what Abraham was going to do. And this is that time thing that, that we don't understand. We've already, when John saw us in the future, we're already there. We have not experienced our presence. God has experienced that, but we are now cognitively experiencing this with God. And then that's really, really deep and theological. And I have trouble wrapping my mind around understanding all of that. I just know that God, that is how the author, which would have been Moses, wrote this down. It was past that God acknowledges. You have pro proven. Yes, he already knows. He already knows what, he knew what Abraham was going to do. And it's honoring, it's an honor. Uh, God wants us to act out in faith what he already knows that we're going to do. And worship because he knows our hearts. It's, it's honoring to him for us to demonstrate the things that he knows ex exist and it, it pleases him. You know, we all know as much um, that as parents and, and spouses and children that, that we love each other, we can tell them over and over and over, but it isn't until we act out that that feeling because the the feeling and the actions need to go hand in hand. I can feel like I love somebody, but it's something to show it is is more important. Because I can tell my husband all the time, I love you, I love you, I love you, and do nothing for him. And he kind of wonders. Our children would wonder. Um, so we, we, to know, I mean, that he, yes, I know he loves me, but it's not as satisfying as experiencing the moment. And God enjoys those moments with us. He enjoys walking with us. He does not necessarily like all of our actions, but he does enjoy being with us. If he didn't, he would not have sent his son. He would have gone on, destroyed, and then recreated. We get to verse 13. Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in a thicket. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. 
Abraham named the place Yahweh Yera, which means the Lord will provide. To this day, the people use that name as a proverb. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Sometimes we have to go up to the mountain for God to provide. And the mountains are not those really easy climbs. Sometimes there are some really rough ones. And in verse 16, and then the Abraham and the the angel of the Lord called again to Abraham from heaven. This is what the Lord says. Because you have obeyed me and not withheld even your son, your only son, I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies. He's still doing that. And your descendants... Uh, and through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. What a huge test. He, his obedience thousands of years ago affect us in today's presence. We are blessed because of his obedience. How many people can be blessed because of our obedience until Christ returns? What an opportunity. Because you have obeyed me. Then they returned to the servants. They, not Abraham, they, and traveled back to Beersheba where Abraham continued to live. What we, we see as the reader, is the Lord or God fulfills the name that Abraham has made reference to. The Lord will provide. No, he said this. God will provide the, the, the lamb. He tells this. He doesn't know how God's going to do it. Even if he had gone all the way and, and completely killed Isaac, he knew that God would would keep his promise how he he didn't know he's not God but he trusted him and so he names that place for who God is that he provides in the end we also know that God swears by his own name uh, there's nobody higher we as people sometimes we will uh, you know I swear on a stack of Bibles uh, I, I swear by God's name. We always have to swear by somebody higher than ourselves. Very seldom would we say, I swear in the name of Judith. Well, if I swear in my own name, um, that may not be a good thing. <laughs> that may not fulfill my promises. But for us, God is the highest, the highest, highest. And, and there's nothing else to swear higher than um, by his own name. And he knows that. So he swears by his own name, which is an encouragement because there is none higher than him. He is the ultimate that we can uh, turn to. He should be the end all for us. Uh, Hebrew says he cannot lie. Where if I swear on my name or swear on somebody else or swear on the grave of, of one of my ancestors, uh, that doesn't mean that they didn't lie or that person or myself. God does not lie. That's Hebrews 6, 18. That is amazing. That's why he can swear by himself on his own name. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 24, this is the utter obedience. Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. That means we have to submit, to deny ourselves, to submit and accept he is all that we need. We don't need anything else. Soon after this, Abraham heard that Milcah, his brother Nahor's wife, had born Nahor eight sons. The oldest was named Uz, the next oldest was Buzz, uh, followed by Camel the ancestor of the Arame Arameans. Kesed, Hazo, Pildash, 
<laughs> Jill Lef Lef and Bethuel. Bethuel became the father of Rebekah, in addition to these eight sons from Milcah. Nahor had four other children from his concubine, Ruma. Their names were Teba, Geham, Tahash, and Mach Machah. Now, that's out of place. Why do we need to know this? It seems unimportant. It's something that you and I would normally skim over, but this is a, a, a little footnote and aside from this amazing moment of other things that are going on because he wants us, he wants to set up the parameters of things that are yet to happen. You know, it's that little teaser, that trailer that we look for when we see movies. Um, nothing is out of place. Everything has purpose. Obedience, obedience, obedience. You know, as I even was saying yesterday to some friends of mine, that a lot of times we, we use the excuse, well, Jesus was the Son of God. Of course he was perfect. Of course he was able to do these things and, and you know, rebuke people. or. But we have the Bible of people, men and women, who demonstrated that they were not perfect, but they still did amazing things because they trusted God implicitly so deeply. Do we do that? Do you do that? Do I do that? Yes, we should because he empowers us. God is about our success. He keeps our promise, his promises to us, whether we keep our promises. Um, memory verses for today because we are in Matthew we are working on the Beatitudes and we're talking about the blessedness blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven blessed are those who mourn who are sorrowful because they will be comforted blessed um, are the meek for they will inherit the earth. Remember, it's not the proud. God despises the proud. It's those that submit to him. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Another reason why we sing praises, read the Psalms, read our scriptures, is so that our spiritual lives are full and we're ready for battle. If you read in, in 1 Samuel, where King Saul ran his army into the ground, they were fatigued, they were tired, and they were not making good choices. And his son Jonathan ate honey because it refreshed him. That is what this does. He is the living waters. He refreshes us. He feeds us so that when we go into spiritual warfare and we go, if we are sitting on the bench, I'm telling you right now, the enemy has you where they want you to be because you're ineffective. And so they're beating down on you. You may not know it, but they are cutting you. I saw, I, I, I didn't see, I was told of a, a movie that was really, really scary where this, this creepy guy um, had opened up somebody's brain and was feeding it to him. That's what the enemy is doing. <laughs> when we're sitting there, they are feeding us all. He doesn't want us on the battlefield. Get up. Don't let them feed, feed your brain to yourself and you eat it and enjoy it. And I know that's gross. <laughs> It is. It's terrifying. It's scary. You should be if you're sitting on the bench. Get up. At least make mistakes. He's going to pick you up. That's a promise. And I've tripped over my feet many times. I did even yesterday. So, <laughs> And then we have verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Show mercy. May it follow you. You will be shown mercy. It may not be of your peers. 
It may not be of another human being, but God will show you mercy. And he has shown you mercy because of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, you have given us example after example of those who have truly walked in obedience to your word. Father, empower us. Let us not be crippled by the enemy, but empower us to stand firm on your word because you will enable us to be victorious over the battles that you have placed us in. Father, I also pray over our country. I pray over our leaders that um, those that are standing for you, that you will continue to keep a hedge of protection over them and that you will speak the words to those that are wicked, that it is enough, that they cannot go any further. Father, we know that we're in a spiritual battle, and this the heat of the battle is hot. And there are those that are injured, but I pray your healing balm over them, that you get them to stand, help us to stand victoriously, that we have our, our, our armor on, and that we're ready to go. We're ready to serve you. We're ready to be who you've called us to be. I pray over each and every one of my brothers and sisters who may hear this, this lesson or those that have not. Either way, I pray for them. May we stand. May we experience revival. May we see just this return that happens before you return, that you will find, you asked while you were here on earth, will, when I return, will I find someone faithful? May we be counted among those that are faithful. And Lord, I know that this is through our obedience to you because we love you. It's not out of dread, but because we love you. And you will make us victorious because our obedience is dependent on you. You have said, apart from me, you can do nothing. So enable us and create in us the desire to be obedient to you. Thank you again for your many blessings. Be with each and every one in your precious and holy name. Amen. Have an amazing day. I love you.